All right. Last time we looked at an article that presented a number of arguments for why uh, capital punishment is justified. And Primorats also discussed a number of arguments uh, against capital punishment, but he, as we saw, Primorats found that um, the arguments against capital punishment are not persuasive. Um, now we're going to take a look at Nathanson's article, An Eye for an Eye. Uh, and Nathanson presents a number of reasons um, for why um, we ought to abolish capital punishment, why we as a society should not have the death penalty. So he starts off the article talking about this old idea uh, of an eye for an eye. This is an old maxim, an old rule of thumb. Um, goes back a long, long way in Western history, obviously. It goes back to the Old Testament, goes back to the Bible. Um, and this was a way of expressing the idea that punishment ought to be proportionate. Um, now, as uh, Nathanson goes on to discuss, there are a couple of ways that you could interpret uh, this uh, old rule of thumb, an eye for an eye. Uh, Nathanson considers two principles that have been used to justify capital punishment, but he finds fault with both. So these would be two different ways of understanding that principle of an eye for an eye. What does that actually mean, an eye for an eye? One way of interpreting it would be to say um, that whatever the criminal did to the victim, we have to do exactly that to the criminal. That's what would be a just punishment. So Nathanson calls that the equal punishment principle. The principle would be uh, whatever the criminal did to the victim is to be done to the criminal. So this is the way that some people understand um, the principle of an eye for an eye. But as Stevenson, I'm, I'm sorry, Nathanson goes on to point out, that could not serve a, as a principle of punishment for a couple of reasons. For one thing, for certain crimes, it would recommend punishments that are immoral. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> in the case of, say, for example, uh, a kidnapper, uh, let's suppose. Uh, there's a kidnapper who has a child. Well, to do exactly to the criminal what the criminal did would be to kidnap the kidnapper's child. But obviously, that would be an immoral punishment. That would be harming uh, an innocent person. Uh, the kidnapper's child was not responsible for the crime um, that the kidnapper committed. So obviously, that would be immoral to punish a person who was not guilty of the crime. Um, so th that's one reason that this equal punishment principle could not work. Um, again, one problem with it is that for certain crimes, it would recommend punishments that are clearly immoral. Um, for many crimes, it would not prescribe any specific punishment. That would be another problem with this principle. Uh, in the case of an airline hijacker, he doesn't have any plane to hijack. So how could you do to him exactly the same thing that the criminal did? Or say, for example, a, a bank robber. Uh, a bank robber doesn't have a bank to rob. How could we do exactly to the criminal, in that case, what the criminal did? So you just start to think about it a little bit. And it's not too hard to see that this equal punishment principle um, couldn't possibly serve as a uh, principle of just punishment. Uh, again, uh, for some crimes, it would prescribe punishments that are immoral. And for others, it would not prescribe any specific punishment. So the equal punishment principle cannot serve as a principle of just punishment. Now, I don't know, you know, this old, this old principle uh, of an eye for an eye that goes back um, to the Old Testament, that goes back to ancient Hebrew civilization. Um, I don't know that it ever was understood this way. If you do a little bit of research on it, uh, most Old Testament scholars uh, seem to say that an eye for an eye um, was not meant in this way, in, in any case. It was not meant as what Nathanson is calling here the equal punishment principle. Um, one, day, one way that they make that case is that there's a much longer, outside of uh, the Old Testament um, books where this um, appears, there's the much longer um, uh, book of laws um, that the ancient Hebrews observed um, in, in the Talmud, uh, another 
um, source on uh, another source on ancient Jewish civilization, a number, another sacred text in the Jewish tradition. And the, the Talmud does not, it, while, while it does give a long list of punishments, it, it doesn't, the list of punishments does not include any punishment that involves maiming someone, involves injuring someone in this way that, that you would be. So suppose um, there's a fight between two men and one man puts out the other's eye. Understood as this equal punishment principle, that would mean that you ought to, that we ought as a society we ought to do to the criminal exactly what was done to the victim. Um, but it's not even clear that that's how this this eye for an eye principle was even understood in ancient times, because in the Talmud, um, the much longer list of laws there there aren't any laws that that um, uh, prescribe that the criminal is to be maimed, is to be injured in this way. So it's more likely that. Most Old Testament scholars argue that the real sense of it was not that an eye for an eye did not mean do exactly to the criminal what the criminal did. Um, that rule of thumb was a, a way of trying to get across the idea that punishment ought to be proportionate. And we've seen this idea in Primorats. We saw that the idea that punishment ought to be proportionate plays a big role in Primorats's argument, doesn't it? And um, most um, Old Testament scholars, most uh, ethicists um, who are familiar with these uh, ancient sources in the Jewish tradition would say that uh, it never meant what Nathanson, I and I for an eye, never meant what Nathanson here is calling this equal punishment principle, do exactly to the criminal what the criminal did, because there's no evidence that the ancient Hebrews did that, um, I, I made use of those kinds of punishments. So it was probably a way to try to get across the idea that punishment ought to be proportionate. One thing that some Old Testament scholars say about it is that it was a way of trying to get across the idea of equality before the law. In many ancient Near Eastern law codes, somebody from a privileged class, um, an elite class, the aristocracy, something like that, would not necessarily get the punishment for the same crime that a member of a lower class would get. And many uh, Old Testament scholars say that's what this principle of an eye for an eye was trying to get across. It was trying to get across the idea that punishment ought to be proportionate um, um, and in a way that did not depend on a person's uh, social status. So it doesn't matter if, if, um, if the criminal was uh, an elite person uh, a uh, person in some uh, upper social class or or uh, or a person in uh, in the bottom class of society it doesn't matter the punishment should be the same for the same crime that's what the principle was trying to get across uh, according to some ethicists who who have written on this so Nathanson may be, when he argues against this equal punishment principle, he may be arguing against a principle that no one actually defends. I mean, no actual philosophers uh, or theologians um, defend that interpretation of the old principle of an eye for an eye. So he may be arguing against a principle of punishment that, that nobody really defends. It's more likely that what was meant for an eye for an eye is what he calls uh, the proportional, the principle of proportional retributivism. Uh, I said last time that retribution just means giving to the criminal what the criminal deserves. Um, I mentioned, we mentioned last time, we saw last time that Primorats calls his uh, theory of punishment, his principle of punishment, the retributive theory or the retributive principle of punishment. So again, retributivism, um, the idea of retribution, that just means giving to the criminal what the criminal deserves. And what does the criminal deserve? Well, uh, we saw Primoros gives great weight to this idea that punishment must be proportional. Um, so what Nathanson calls the, pro the principle of proportional retributivism, this would be a, a, another way of understanding the old principle, principle of an eye for an eye. We would take that to mean that the severity of punishment should be commensurate with the seriousness of the wrong. Okay, um, it seems more likely that that is what was meant traditionally by an eye for an eye. So it makes more sense to spend time examining this principle. And if one is going to argue against the death penalty, then, then one has to show that the death penalty is not dictated by following this principle. 
Well, that is what Nathanson finds. Um, Nathanson says that the principle is no help to death penalty advocates because it does not require that murderers be executed. All that it requires is that if murder is the most serious crime, then murder should be punished by the most serious punishment on the scale. Uh, the principle does not tell us what this punishment should be, however, and it is quite compatible with the view that the most severe punishment should be a long prison term. Okay, so the if the principle is give the punishment that is proportionate, give the, again, if the principle is severity of punishment should be commensurate with the seriousness of the wrong, Nathanson would argue, well, that just means we have to give, for the worst crime, murder, we have to give the worst punishment that we have. But we as a society might decide that the worst punishment that we have is, say, life in prison. We as a society, it does not follow from that principle that we as a society have to decide that the worst punishment is going to be execution, is going to be the death penalty. Okay, so as Nathanson sees it, even the principle that punishment ought to be proportionate does not necessarily have the consequence that the punishment for murder has to be the death penalty has to be execution. All that follows from that principle, Nathanson would say, is that the punishment for the worst crime murder has to be the worst punishment. But we as a society could still decide that that punishment ought to be life in prison. Okay, so that's his argument thus far. Now, if we think back to Primorod's um, and his line of thinking, um, of course, he would reply to this that nothing other than the death penalty could be a commensurate punishment for the crime of murder. Um, as we saw Primorat say last, not, last time, he would say that a long prison term is to try to measure the value of a human life, namely the human life that was, uh, that was taken by the murderer. A long prison term is an attempt to try to measure the value of a human life in terms of some other value, some value that is not commensurate, uh, to use this term that that Nathanson has used here, or to use, um, is to try to measure the value of a human life in terms of some other value that is not commensurable. That is to say, can't be measured by that same value. So I think we uh, all agree, I don't think anybody believes that, say, for example, a fine would be an appropriate punishment for the crime of murder, right? Why is that? Primrose would argue because the value of money is not commensurate with the value of a life. And similarly, Primrose would reply to this argument that the, the value in which uh, a long prison term is measured, namely the value of time, is here again not commensurate with the value of a human life. Um, because in the case of the victim of a murder, the victim of the murder um, has no time. All the time, uh, all the all the victim's future was taken away. So the only thing that could be, Primorats would reply to this: that the only thing that could be a commensurate punishment would be the taking of a second life, namely the life of the murderer. So, not hard to anticipate what the argument would be on the other side here, um, but we're looking at both uh, points of view on this issue. Mm -mm. Nathanson spends a lot of time in the article focusing on this idea that abolishing the death penalty would have a certain symbolic value. It would have a certain symbolic effect. And he thinks that that symbolic value and, and that symbolic effect, the message that it would send to society, let's put it that way, if we were to do away with the death penalty, if we were to abolish the death penalty, capital punishment, he thinks the message that it would send to society would be a good one. It would be a message that would make society uh, a less violent place, a society in which people are more likely to have respect for the kind of intrinsic, the kind of inherent dignity of human life. He thinks the message that it would send would help to cultivate a culture of respect for life. Uh, Nathanson says that by refraining from executing murderers, we, expect, we express our respect for the dignity of human beings, even those who have committed terrible crimes. By not having capital punishment, we affirm 
Nathanson says, or I'm paraphrasing, but the thrust of um, the argument would be that we affirm the humanity of the criminal. We express our commitment to the premise that no human life is, as Nathanson says, totally without human value. Okay, so a lot of um, what he says in the article, a lot of his argument has to do with this idea um, of the symbolic value of abolishing the death penalty, the message that it would send to society. He thinks the message that it would send to society would be, or would have the effect, uh, the message would be one, again, of respect for the dignity of human beings. And he thinks that the effect that that message would have would be to make society a less violent place, to make society a more peaceful, more peaceful place. He's arguing that when society sees the state having uh, a murderer um, in custody and having the power to execute the murderer, but the, but the state does not do that. The state refrains from executing this murderer, even though it could. That would send a, a message of not um, resorting to violence, uh, of not resolving our conflicts with violence. That's part of the message that Nathanson thinks it would, it would send to society as a whole if we were to do away with the death penalty. So that's a lot of his argument. He says that when the state has a murderer in its power, and could execute him, but does not, this conveys the idea that even though this person has done wrong, and even though we may be angry, outraged, and indignant with him, we will nonetheless control ourselves in a way that he did not. So Nathanson believes that abolishing the death penalty will set an example of restraint. Uh, it will encourage people to not react to conflict with anger. So again, the symbolic value of doing away with the death penalty, uh, the message that it would send us to society, to society, Nathanson believes it would be a good one. It would be this good example of restraint. Uh, we, we society, we the state, acting on behalf of society, have this murderer in our power. We could execute him, but we're not going to do that. And that shows, uh, that example of restraint shows people that um, we shouldn't try to resolve our conflicts um, with violence. Uh, we shouldn't react to our feelings of outrage at this terrible crime. We shouldn't re react to our sense of anger and outrage. Um, the fact that we're indignant should not therefore lead us to react with anger, though. Even though we feel anger, we shouldn't react with anger. Um, we should act with restraint. That's the good message that Nathanson thinks doing away with the death penalty would send to society. He thinks it would make society a more peaceful, a, a less violent place, a, a society in which, a society that cultivates respect for human life by holding up the example of refraining from killing even even the most violent people among us. That would, again, cultivate this sense of respect for the dignity of every human life, make people less likely to resort to violence, um, make people less likely to react um, uh, with anger. Nathanson writes, we want the state to set an example of proper behavior. We want to avoid the cycle of violence that can come from retaliation and counter retaliation. He says that violence is a contagion that arouses hatred and anger. And if unchecked, it simply leads to still more violence. So again, he thinks the message that it would send to society is that we are going to stop the cycle of violence here. We, acting as society, acting through the state, will send the message that we are going to stop this cycle of violence. <clears throat> the murderer committed a murder, killed an innocent human being. Um, that outrages us. And we could, in that feeling of hatred and anger, uh, react from those feelings and uh, do violence upon, mete out violence to the criminal because of his violent crime. That's what we could do. But here again, Nathanson thinks that if we showed restraint, uh, here again, if we do that, he says, that's just going to fuel this uh, cycle of violence, this contagion, this cycle of violence. I guess his thought is that if we then as a society execute the murderer, 
then that will just feed a growing sense of violence, I guess. I'm not sure exactly what he has in mind here. Maybe um, maybe family and friends of the murderer will then feel, um, maybe some of them will feel that the state was not justified uh, in killing him, and so that will just sow more feelings of violence and anger against society, and I guess his thought is that the, the cycle will just keep spiraling out of control from there. But we as a society can choose to act with restraint instead, and that good example will encourage people not to um, react to conflict with violence, not to act out of hatred uh, and anger, um, but rather it will set an example of resolving conflicts um, without resorting to violence and without giving in to our passions. <clears throat> Nathanson discusses the argument that we mentioned um, last time in connection with Primorats. We saw Primorats argue that in committing a crime, a uh, criminal has given up his rights. Uh, Primorats made this point that everyone has a right to life, but once someone violates that right in someone else, he has given up his claim to be protected by that right. Uh, once a criminal has violated the right, someone else's right to life, um, he has forfeited his claim to be protected by that same right. So we saw Primorats make that argument. <clears throat> Nathanson replies to that kind of argument uh, for the death penalty by saying that when someone commits a crime, um, he agrees that, that that person has given up some of his rights. But Nathanson goes on to point out it doesn't follow that the criminal has forfeited all of his or her rights. The criminal retains certain rights simply in virtue of being a human being. Uh, so he offers as an example uh, the, uh, the Eighth Amendment's ban on cruel punishments. So uh, Nathanson uh, agrees that when someone commits a crime, that amounts to forfeiting some of one's rights. But it doesn't follow that the criminal has forfeited all of his or her rights. The criminal retains certain rights simply in virtue of being a human being. Uh, for example, the criminal, is, the criminal is, is still protected by the constitutional ban on cruel punishments. The Eighth Amendment to the Constitution bans cruel, punish, bans cruel punishments, uh, cruel and unusual punishments. So from the fact that somebody has committed a terrible crime, even a horrific murder, it doesn't follow that we may do whatever we want to him. Mm -mm. There are still legal protections that even uh, a criminal has, and there are still human rights that even that even the worst uh, murderer, even the worst criminal has. Mm -mm. So Nathanson mentions the Constitution's ban on cruel punishments, uh, and he offers that as a as an example of one of the limits of what we may do to a human being there are certain limits on what we may do and and the eighth amendment to our constitution sets forth one of those limits we may not we we may not use torture we may not use cruel punishments that's an old principle in our legal tradition it goes back a long long way obviously it goes back to the bill of rights in the constitution and even before that actually that was in turn modeled on the english bill of rights the english bill of rights of 1689 uh, included uh, a ban on cruel punishments as well. So it's really an old, old principle in our legal tradition. It really goes back, uh, even before we were a country, even back to the colonies, even back to, uh, to our English heritage, our British heritage. One thing that I would say about this argument, though, is that it is vulnerable to a, a pretty basic objection. Uh, Nathanson mentions the Constitution's ban on cruel punishments, and it's true that that is in the Eighth Amendment. But it's also true that the death penalty is mentioned in the Bill of Rights in a way that makes clear the authors of the Bill of Rights did not regard the death penalty as a cruel or unusual punishment for the crime of murder. Uh, the death penalty is mentioned in the Fifth Amendment. So Nathan neglects to point that out. So I think that's a pretty uh, basic objection to his argument here. Um, but it is true, as Nathan says, uh, uh, the way that Nathan, uh, Nathanson makes this point is to say that it doesn't follow from the vileness of their actions that we can do anything whatsoever to them. So no matter how, how terrible 
a crime was, it doesn't follow that we can just do whatever we want to the criminal. Uh, he goes on to write, why do these limits hold? Because this person remains a human being. And we think that there is something in him that we must continue to respect in spite of his terrible acts. <clears throat> Why does our Constitution ban cruel and unusual punishments? It, it, it's an interesting question. Um, the reason I want to spend a moment on, on it here is um, sometimes um, um, students will argue that the punishment uh, for murder ought to be in some way even more severe than just capital punishment, even more severe than just the death penalty. Some students think that for particularly heinous murders or, or other kinds of heinous crimes, uh, a lot of students think that the punishment should include uh, making the criminal suffer a lot before we execute him. So um, I would observe that a supporter of the death penalty like Primorats to go back to um, last time, would not agree with that because um, here again, we saw Primorats make the point that there isn't any other punishment that is commensurable to the destruction of an innocent human life, not even uh, making not even making the criminal suffer, uh, Primorats would say. Mm-mm-mm. <clears throat> There isn't anything that is equivalent to the destruction of an innocent human life, Primorats would say, except taking the murderer's life. Um, <clears throat> In connection with that point, uh, Primorats cites Kant. Uh, again, as I emphasized last time, Primorats' approach to this issue is clearly in that Kantian tradition, that anti-consequentialist tradition. And on page 372, Primorats mentions uh, Kant on the on this issue that sometimes does come up uh, in the discussion of this issue in my classes. Sometimes students say not only should, um, in the case of uh, heinous, um, horrific murders, not only should the criminal be um, executed, but to make, to make the punishment truly proportionate, the criminal should be made to suffer for a long time before being um, executed. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, Primorats would not agree with that, and the Kantian tradition would not agree with that. On page 372, Primorats cites Kant in the footnotes there. Um, the way Kant put the point was this. Kant wrote, There is no parallel between death and even the most miserable life, so that there is no equality of crime and retribution in the case of murder unless the perpetrator is judicially put to death. So the Kantian view is that um, even in the most miserable life, there is still some value. Um, maybe the person being, maybe the murderer being made to suffer uh, at least has the hope that the suffering um, might not be so bad at, at some point. At least there is even, at least there is some hope in even the most miserable life. But Kant's point was that in the case of the victim of the murder, there is no hope. There's no value at all because that person's life has been taken away. That person's worldly um, existence is over, so there is no earthly value that that person can enjoy. And again, uh, Kant's view was that even in the most miserable lives, there is some value. So there really isn't anything that is commensurate with. Again, Primorats would say, the, uh, Kant would say, there isn't anything that is commensurate with the crime of murder as a punishment, except taking the murderer's life. So that's one thing that I would say about that argument. And then I would just make one other observation about why we don't um, do that. As I said a moment ago, it's an old principle in our legal tradition, going back to our Bill of Rights, that we don't torture people. Um, why is that? Well, um, one of the founding fathers of this republic, Patrick Henry, asked this question. He asked, what has distinguished our ancestors? Um, and he thought it was this, that they would not admit of tortures or cruel and barbarous punishments. But, uh, this was around the time of the uh, writing of the Bill of Rights, uh, Patrick Henry goes on to say that he's worried that Congress, that is to say the, the Congress of the New Republic, may introduce the practice of the civil law in preference to that of the common law. So as I mentioned a moment ago, um, it was an old principle in our legal tradition, going back to the colonies, going back to England even, 
um, that cruel punishments, torture, say for example, was uh, an unjust uh, punishment. And Patrick Henry was afraid that uh, states might pass their own laws overriding that traditional common law. He was very concerned about that, and that's one reason that he wanted a ban on cruel punishments uh, to be included in the Bill of Rights, uh, which, uh, which uh, as we've said, it is. He goes on to say they may, he, he was fearful that some states may introduce the practice of France, Spain, and Germany. So to uh, the founders of this republic, uh, the, the, the kinds of thinkers who were influential on the writing of documents like the Declaration and the Constitution, um, in their mind, cruel punishments, torture, say, for example, was associated with uh, tyrannical governments, with authoritarian governments, with oppressive governments, um, like, as Henry, Patrick Henry says here, France and Spain and Germany. They saw those monarchies as very cruel and oppressive to their people. They wanted our legal um, principles to be modeled on the British model. They associated the British model with limited government. So in short, the founders associated cruel punishments with tyranny. Uh, they favored limited government on the British model. Banning cruel punishments was a way of limiting government's power. And it's an old principle in our, it's an old political and legal principle uh, uh, in American history that government's power ought to be limited. So that's why there is that ban on cruel punishments in the uh, Bill of Rights. Uh, and that's why, here again, um, <clears throat> some other punishment other than taking the life of the murderer, even, even if it involves imposing a lot of suffering on the murderer, still is not a commensurate punishment from the point of view of uh, here again, many thinkers. Uh, here again, as Kant said, even in the most miserable life, there is some value. But his point being, when it comes to the victim of the murder, there's no value left in that person's life because that person's life has been taken away. So, a couple of observations about that argument. Mm -mm. Um, here again, Nathan, much of Nathanson's argument focuses on this fact that there is a limit to what we may do to any human being, even the worst criminal. Uh, we saw that the concept of desert plays uh, an important role in Primorotz's arguments for um, the death penalty. We saw Primorotz say that when it comes to the moral justification of the death penalty, the only relevant consideration, uh, the only relevant considerations, I should say, are considerations to do with justice, such as is this the punishment that is proportionate to the severity of the crime? And is this punishment what the criminal deserves? Again, this idea of desert or what someone deserves, as we saw, plays a very important role in Primorotz's arguments for the death penalty. Well, Nathanson makes a distinction between what he calls personal desert and human desert. <clears throat> What does he mean by that? Person, by personal desert, we would mean we would be talking about what someone deserves because of what he or she has done. So Nathanson calls personal desert what people des. Uh, speaking of personal desert, I should say, Nathanson says that what people deserve depends on what they have done, and that is oftentimes the way that we use uh, this notion of somebody deserving something. Oftentimes, that is our concept of desert. We think that the person who works the hardest uh, should get the promotion or the person who's best qualified should get the job, something like that. We do talk all, this, all the time uh, in these kinds of terms that uh, Nathanson speaks of as uh, involving personal desert. But Nathanson says beyond personal desert, there's also what he calls human desert. Um, and that is um, the idea that everyone deserves a certain level of treatment simply in virtue of being human. <clears throat> so even um, the worst criminal, um, even um, the most uh, terrible murderer, is still a human being. And Nathanson would argue that simply in virtue of being a human being, here again, there are certain things that he deserves, namely a certain uh, level, a uh, minimally decent level of treatment. 
Nathanson writes that by refraining from executing murderers, we express and reaffirm our belief in the inalienable, unforfeitable core of human dignity. We show our determination to accord at least the minimal respect, even to the worst human beings. So Nathanson, uh, here again, this concept of desert, we saw plays an important role in Primorotz's argument for the death penalty. He thinks the most important question or one of the most important issues to the moral justification of the death penalty is this notion that we must give the criminal what he deserves. And as we know, Primorotz goes on to argue that the death penalty is what a murderer deserves. He argues that for a number of reasons. Nathanson also talks about this concept of desert, but again, he makes this distinction between personal desert and, on the other hand, human desert. Uh, and there are some things that every human being deserves. There are some things such as what Nathanson calls here uh, a, a minimal respect, a minimal level of decent treatment that every human being deserves. So that's what Nathanson means here, again, by human desert. Uh, I have a couple of critical questions to ask about Nathanson's argument, so let me pose them, just a couple of critical thinking questions to reflect on uh, in connection with some of his arguments. Uh, at one point in the article, Nathanson writes, quote, We speak of the sanctity of life rather than its value or worth. Uh, that which is sacred remains in some sense untouchable, and its value is not dependent on its worth or usefulness to us. And then Nathanson cites Kant's principle of humanity in support of this point. Um, you'll remember that Kant's principle of humanity says it's never morally permissible to treat a person merely as a means. You should always treat a, another human being as an end in himself or herself as well. Well, a critical question about that, though, it would be this. Is it clearly the case that capital punishment amounts to treating the murderer in terms of his, as Nathanson puts it, his usefulness to us? Is that what we're doing? That's what Nathanson says. So if that's true, we would be using him as a mere means, and we know that Kant's principle of humanity rules out ever using somebody only as a means. But there's, a, I think, a pretty simple objection to that argument, uh, namely the fact that Kant, the author of the principle of humanity, thought that capital punishment was justified. Kant did not think it was true that we are treating a murderer as a mere means if we execute him, as Nathanson says. Is that true? Are we, in that case, in the case of executing a murderer, are we treating the murderer as a mere means? Kant did not believe so. Kant believed that we're treating him as an end in himself because we are recognizing his rationality, which again, as we saw in the second unit of the course, uh, that's the most important trait of human beings for Kant, namely our capacity for reason, our capacity for rationality. <clears throat> and Kant believed that we are recognizing the reason of a murder when we execute him, because we're recognizing that he deliberated on different possible courses of action and, and freely chose a course of action that he knew was the worst crime and freely chose to put himself at risk of receiving the worst punishment. Um, and again, Kant, like Primorotz, would say the only punishment that is proportionate to the crime of murder is uh, taking the life of the murderer. <clears throat> um, so that's one critical question that I would raise about Nathanson's argument there. He cites the principle of humanity as if that obviously shows that capital punishment is unjust, but the author of the principle of humanity, Kant, did not believe that the death penalty was unjust. He believed it was just. In fact, he believed very strongly that it was just. He wrote at one point, this is not in your book, this is not in your reading, I'm just bringing this out from another, um, uh, another source uh, on Kant's writings. Uh, Kant wrote that even if a civil society were to be dissolved by the consent of all its members, uh, for example, if a people inhabiting an island decided to separate and disperse throughout the world, the last murderer remaining in prison would first have to be executed so that each has done to him what his deeds deserve. Again, this concept of desert plays a very important role in, in the Kantian uh, approach to the issue as we've seen. So that each has done to him what his, deed deserve, what his deeds deserve. And blood guilt does not cling to the people for not having insisted upon this punishment. 
for otherwise the people can be regarded as collaborators in this public violation of justice. So Kant goes further than, than even what we saw in Primorats. He goes so far as to say that if we don't execute a murderer, then we are collaborators in an injustice. We, he says uh, blood guilt will cling to us. That is to say, to some extent, we are guilty for allowing that injustice to stand. Uh, the Kantian view, Primorats' view, as we have seen, is that uh, justice requires that we give to a murderer what he deserves and that we give to a murderer the proportionate punishment for the worst of crimes. And as we've seen, Kant and Primorats believes that only execution is proportionate to the crime of murder. Uh, one other um, critical question that I would raise about Primorats, I'm sorry, um, Nathanson's argument would be this. Uh, Nathanson writes that we want the state to set an example of proper behavior. We do not want to encourage people to resort to violence to settle conflicts when there are other ways available. And then he goes on to say only defensive violence is justifiable. Okay, well, I have a couple of questions about that. First of all, when he says we want the state to set an example of proper behavior, okay, so his implication being that if we execute a murderer, we are setting an example of violent uh, behavior, a bad example. Well, one question that I have about this would be, isn't this argument vulnerable to counterexamples that aren't that hard to think of? When we put people in prison, are we therefore encouraging them to kidnap people? Uh, when we find people, are we therefore encouraging people to steal from people? Um, it doesn't seem like that good an argument. Um, and then uh, a question that I would raise about this point, Nathanson says, only defensive violence is justifiable. Well, one question that I think one could raise about that would be, um, this, is it clear that capital punishment isn't defensive violence? He's assuming that capital punishment is not a kind of defensive violence. But someone on the other side of the issue could, I think, make the case, make an argument, that in, in, in point of fact, capital punishment, the death penalty, is society defending itself from murderers. Uh, so is it clear that capital punishment isn't defensive violence? Uh, consider this. Murders in prison are still a threat. They're a threat to guards. Uh, they're a threat to other prisoners. Uh, and they're still a threat to the public if they escape, which does sometimes happen. So someone on the other side of this, argue, uh, this issue could, could challenge Nathanson's assumption that capital punishment is not itself a kind of defensive violence. Somebody on the other side of this issue might say that it is. So something to think about there.